England was not sufficiently unified to initially challenge Spain seriously as a colonizer. Yet, Henry VIII, in 1497, come on, in 1497, did outfit a freelancing Italian navigator by the name of John Cabot. Remember I said that these freelance people would oftentimes sail for other countries? This is an Italian, and he sails for England. So anything he claims goes to England, not to his home country of Italy. In 1497, five years after Columbus, this is right out of the hatch, the English get a claim in North America. This bold mariner touched on the coast of Newfoundland while searching for the direct ocean route to the Indies. Still, we do not see the well, this isn't still, this was back then, the North and, America, North and South American continents as anything of value. No, how do we get around it? How do we get through it? The Indians kept talking about this Northwest Passage, and so we were trying, now granted, it looked like, I mean, you could go quite a distance by water, but there is no way through the continent. But that's what he was looking for up here around Newfoundland. He wanted to find that Northwest Passage. In the 1400s, the English went through a civil war. It was known as the War of the Roses. It was between the Stuart and the Tudor families. The Tudor family ultimately comes out supreme. And if we were in class, I would ask you, why is it called the War of the Roses? It has nothing to do with roses except for the fact that the family crest, back then nobility, people of privilege, would have a crest. We would think of it today as like a logo. Apple computers, there's that logo of that multicolored apple. Their family crest was a rose. Both houses, the Tudors and the Stuarts, had a rose. One was a yellow rose and one was a red rose. So in history it's been nicknamed called the War of the Roses. In 1509 Henry VIII did not accept the Catholic Church's views of marriage and divorce. Henry VIII is Tudor. The Tudors had won out in the fight. The only problem is he has married Catherine of Aragon. Remember, with Queen Isabella and um, Ferdinand, Castile and Aragon, he has married into nobility here, which was quite, quite common back then. You keep the peace. If you're all related, you don't want to take up a war against your in-laws or your cousins or whatnot. And so he's married into the Spanish noble family. She is devoutly Roman Catholic. And if we were in class, I would ask you what, according to the Catholic Church, used to be and should still be, but they're much more lax on this now, the consequence of divorce. Divorce in the Catholic Church's theology was excommunication. You would no longer be allowed to go to heaven. And so this is a very big problem. Is Catherine going to allow her husband to divorce her? No way. Then she can't get into heaven. And so what you will have occurring here will be the English Reformation, but we'll get it, that in, into that in just a minute. These changes that will take place will be more political than religious, but Henry VIII, how do we remember Henry VIII? He puts through the English Reformation. 
Herman's Hermits released a song in 1965. They were part of the British invasion, all of these English singers that came over, and America was absolutely gaga for them. The Beatles, all these such groups. And I used to have where if I hit on this big old black space over here, it would bring up Herman's Hermits singing for the Ed Sullivan show, and you would hear the song. But I have not been able to get that to work now. So, once again, this is <laughs> a little before your time, but I grew up with this song, and it's one way to remember Henry VIII. I am partially tone deaf, but it goes, I'm and they say Henry instead of Henry because they can't pronounce Henry in England. I'm Henry the Eighth, I am. Henry the Eighth, I am, I am. I got married to the widow next door. She's been married seven times before, and everyone was an Henry. She wouldn't have a Willie or a Sam. I'm the Eighth Old Man, I'm Henry. Henry the Eighth, I am. Second verse, same as the first, and they sing it again, and then they come off with a final third. So all three verses are exactly the same, and then at the very end, H E N R Y, Henry, Henry, Henry the Eighth, I am, I am, Henry the Eighth, I am. Gah! So that's the way. I remember that song. You will have to get on YouTube and listen to Henry VIII by Herman's Hermits. But yes, he will make this great change. Back to Henry. The reason he wanted this divorce from Catherine was that she did not produce a male heir. She produced a female child, but she did not produce a male child. And as king, he must have a son to take over the throne. So this must be the wife's fault. We have since learned in biology, this was not the wife's fault. The wife can only give off X chromosome. And it is the husband who gives off in his sperm either X or Y. If he gives off X, two X's makes a girl. If he gives off a Y that mates, not mates, that um, impregnates the egg, an X and a Y is a male. But he blamed her. She would not divorce him, and so he sent her away to a monastery. I don't know if she ever got to see her daughter again, but he would continue to marry women. He did have one or two sons, I'm trying to think, was it one or two? But they died all in infancy. And so he died without a male heir. He had eight wives, but as the song goes, um, the gentleman who was marrying her was the eighth husband that she had, and they all were Henry's. In 1532 to 1534, Parliament established the Anglican Church. This was the English Reformation, but as I said, it was mainly political. People, when I grew up, we'd hear the joke about the Anglican Church is a divorce away from the Catholic Church. Well, what did that mean? It got created so that Henry VIII could have his divorce from Catherine. As head of the Roman Catholic Church, the Pope on earth is the person in charge. In the Anglican Church, the person on earth who is in charge is the king or queen. So, as head of his own church, can he grant himself a divorce? Yes. Can he do it without excommunicating himself? Yes, absolutely. So, the Anglican Church is a divorce away from the Catholic Church. Meanwhile, what's going on in the country otherwise? Prior to this time, the Magna Carta had been signed in 1215, and that is very important in English history. 
This gave rights and privileges to Englishmen. In the current situation, probably one of the most powerful nations in the world is the United States. And people from the United States can rather easily get visas to go just about anywhere in the world. We can travel and come home. Now, if you're from, let's say, um, Afghanistan, and you want to come to the United States, is it going to be easy to get a visa? No. The United States might have quite a procedure, and it may take years to get permission to come here. But if I should request a visa to go to Afghanistan, I probably would have nowhere near the difficulty to go there as I anticipate, as someone coming the other way would anticipate. I remember a couple years ago, we went to Azerbaijan, and I got my passport renewed, and, you know, the whole family were ready to go, and I said, we haven't applied for visas, and my daughter got on her cell phone, and within a few minutes, we all had visas to go to Azerbaijan, and I'm thinking, this isn't the way life works. <laughs> if you are an American citizen, it is. Well, to be an Englishman back then was what it's like to be an American citizen. You have rights and privileges that no other European nation's poor, regular, any kind of citizen had. I don't care how illiterate, how poor, how down and dirty you were as an Englishman, you still were a politically above a Frenchman, a German, a Dutchman, because you had rights written into your constitution, the Magna Carta that gave Englishmen privileges that no other serf in some other nation had. And this is very important to remember, the rights and privileges of an Englishman. And we will come back to that thought a number of times. And we move to a new topic, the mercantilistic theory. This is a theory that shaped and justified English exploration of the American colonies. According to the doctrine of mercantilism or the theory of mercantilism, the colonies exist for the benefit of the mother country. They should add to its wealth, prosperity, and self-sufficiency. Otherwise, why go to all the trouble and expense of governing and protecting them? Yes, there is a bit of a desire to create colonies to spread Christianity, but the primary reason that the English created colonies was the mercantilistic theory. The colony is to benefit the mother country in quite a few different ways. Otherwise, why bother? Right at, after the Civil War, Russia, I'm changing topics on you here, Russia was in a lot of difficulty and it looked like she might go to war with England. Now, Alaska was part of Russia. She owned it. But they had outfished and outfurred Russia. I'm sorry, Alaska. And it was an economic liability. It was costing Russia more money to send supplies in to all the trading posts and locations that Russia held in Alaska than she was netting on fish and fur. Now, earlier she had really taken a good benefit out of Alaska, but now she'd outfished and outfurred it, and it was costing her. Plus, Alaska is off of Canada. Once again, I'm referring to right after the Civil War, eight, late 1860s. And if Russia went to war with England, Canada being a Rush, an English possession, she might just lose Alaska to the English. If they marched in, she probably couldn't defend Alaska very well. So Russia thinks to herself, 
what if I could sell Alaska before I lose her? And so she propositions Secretary of State Seward and says, hey, how would you like to buy Alaska? And Americans are thinking, oh, man, fish, furs. But there were no fish and furs there as they were anticipating. Seward goes ahead and buys, of course, with presidential um, permission, Alaska from the Russians. Many also thought that this was absolute ludicrousy, and it was called Walrusia instead of Alaska. It was called Frigidia, um, Seward's Folly. It has since come to be very valuable. First, we had the gold rush at the turn of the century, and now all of the natural gas up there. Russia would give anything to have Alaska back. But Alaska had become an economic liability. She was not benefiting from it. English philosophy of mercantilism. The colony must benefit the mother country. So here we have what is currently the United States, but it will be the colonies, making up the 13 colonies. And here we have England over here. Ah, come on. First of all, economic changes were going on in England. People were moving from the country to the cities, and the Industrial Revolution was beginning. Uh, poor serf out on his land, he didn't own the land, he would rent it from the landowner, and Man, it was a miserable living. You had to pay a portion of every crop to the landowner, and you slowly tended to get poorer and poorer. And so new upcoming farm kids are saying, why do I want to stay here? I would rather go to the city and work in industry. They had just were beginning the Industrial Revolution in England. They had it, and then it would eventually come to the colonies. So many people were moving to the cities. They were overcrowded. You actually had more workers than you needed. But these were not just any people. These were Englishmen with the rights and privileges of an Englishman. And so it was felt that the colonies would be a good place to send all of these poor but sturdy British citizens. To make a colony last, you got to have people come there. They got to stay there. They have to grow the colony. Possession is nine tenths of the law. So if we send people there and we can hold our post, then we show to the world this is an English colony. So that is one way the colony is to benefit the mother country. We are going to rel relieve the pressure of all of these poor people in the city. Secondly, the colony also benefited the mother country by being a secondary market for English manufactured goods. I have a factory here in England and I am selling my manufactured goods. I have covered every shire and borough of England. I'm making widgets and I can sell no more widgets in England from my one factory. Well, I want to open two factories. I want to sell even more widgets. I need more markets. Hey, if we have colonies over here, people living in those colonies, they need widgets too. And so I can continue to make my manufactured goods and sell them to the colonists. Oh, yippee skippy. You will buy my manufactured goods. Third, England was to provide government for the colonists. Yet as the Americans matured, they acquired privileges of self-government enjoyed by no other colonial peoples. The people that were in India, which was a British colony, did not have these self-governing um, 
policies that they enjoyed, the French colonists in their colonies. They did not have this, but slowly with time, the English colonies, colonists in the 13 colonies began to acquire privileges of self-government. They set up 13 parliaments of their own, and they aped the parliamentary methods of the mother country. Ultimately, they came to regard their own American legislature, legislative bodies as more or less on the same footing with the great mother parliament back in London. This was not part of England's plan. No, you colonists, you just go <coughs> over and do your colonial thing, and we, England, the mother country, will handle all of government for you. Just don't worry your little heads about that. Fourth, England was to supply defense or protection against the Dutch, the Spanish, the French, the Indians, the pirates. So you sit here and do your colonial thing, and who has the biggest navy in the world? England does. We will protect you, your coast. We will provide defense. And if you need redcoats for fighting, we will send redcoats. So you do your colonial thing. We will provide defense for you. The colonists, in turn, while receiving this military benefit at no cost to ourselves, were in turn to provide raw materials to England. They were restricted in what they might produce and were forbidden to manufacture for export certain products. They were not to compete with English manufacturing. So if England has a big wool industry, are the colonists to raise sheep and send wool back to England? Absolutely not. You're going to compete with the mother country. You're to grow raw materials. So we want you to grow cotton. Can they grow cotton in England? Not really very well. I don't think at all. It's too cold and damp a climate. But you can grow cotton here and you can send it to us. You can grow tobacco, which they'd learned from the Spanish um, colonization became very popular in Europe. So send us back tobacco, send us rice, send us indigo, things that we cannot grow here. Not compete with the English manufacturers. They were to provide furs, fish, grains, timber, sugar, tobacco, indigo, tar, etc. Thus keeping the money within the empire and eliminating the need of purchasing items from other nations. The concept was buy English. This created, of course, a trade imbalance. So if you grow tobacco, I don't have to go to Spain down here and get tobacco. Pounds, money, leaves the empire if I do so. So you grow the tobacco and send it here. This creates a trade imbalance. Yes, a trade imbalance which benefits the mother country, not the colonists. Raw materials do not cost as much. And so they are sending cheap product to England and receiving cents on the pound pence on the pound for these cheap materials. Meanwhile, England is producing manufactured goods which are much more expensive and the colonists is having to pay big money, pounds, for these English goods. So you have a money drain here. More money is going to pay for manufactured goods to England than England is receiving from the raw materials that the colony colonies are sending them. We have had that situation in the last 30 years in the United States. That big concept, buy American. Don't let the jobs go offshore. Buy Fords. Buy Cadillacs. 
buy GMC, buy American-made cars, don't buy Toyotas, don't buy Hyundais, don't buy other countries' cars. Keep the jobs in America. Keep the money in America. Cars are very expensive. Oftentimes, it is only the United States manufacture, uh, I'm sorry, agricultural goods and our weaponry that we sell that keeps any kind of balance on our trade deals. And so for years, we were fighting Japan. You know, we're, you got to buy some stuff from us. All our dollars are going to you, and you're buying very little from us, and very little of your yen is coming back to us. We have a trade imbalance here. Money is draining out of the United States to, to Japan. Same thing here. Don't do it if it doesn't benefit the mother country. Trade imbalance, yes, that's what we want. And the colonials were to ensure British naval supremacy. Queen of the Seas was the title England had. How could she continue to be Queen of the Seas? First of all, by furnishing ships particularly in New England, many shipyards were set up building boats. You got lumber, you got water power, and you can build the boats in this long coastal line here. So supply ships to England, supply stores, supply sailors, some things that the English Navy desperately needed. And I think that's a good point to stop. The mercantilistic system. For the test, I will not make you recreate this chart, but you need to understand this chart. I may give you a question and say, which of the following is not part of the mercantilistic theory to benefit the mother country? And if I throw something give you three right answers and then a wrong answer, you should be able to, by understanding this chart, to easily pick out which one is the incorrect answer. So once again, don't memorize it. Understand the concept of it. And I'm taking a break. Thank you.